it seems that unless you just get over it, you're going to go crazy. Because I don't understand how anyone can live here. We've just arrived here, but we didn't expect this place to look so bad. And I don't even remember seeing a mess like this anywhere in Russia. That's a typical situation. Oh my God. We get our pensions. What's the problem? At least we have a roof over our heads. I've already shown you how Russian villages are dying and losing their last inhabitants. This time, I'll show you one of the regional centers of Russia, Arkhangelsk, which I visited at the end of 2020. It's the largest city in the European north part of Russia. It's home to more than 340,000 people. There are areas in the city center where people live in rotten wooden houses that no one wants to fix or resettle. One month after posting this video on my main channel, I received a call from the Arkhangelsk police. The reason was that a local resident accused me of insulting their people and disrespecting society. During the examination process, the officers found no violations and the case was closed. So let's see what all the hype was about. If you haven't yet seen my other videos from the Russian North, then be sure to check out my channel, watch and subscribe. I post new videos once a week, so if you're interested in my content, click on the bell so you don't miss it. This is Arkhangelsk in 2020. Behind me is one of the few uninhabited buildings here. It was so rotten and dilapidated that it collapsed and the government was eventually forced to resettle the people living here. All other buildings around here are in slightly better condition, but they're also on the verge of collapse. And yet, people still live in them. This type of housing was built 90 years ago, back in the 1930s. The construction took place when the region was rapidly developing. These barracks obviously weren't supposed to last until the 21st century and to accommodate people for such a long time. They don't even have proper living conditions. They're now completely rotten, but thousands of people continue to live in them. And they probably will until all their homes rot and collapse completely. I first came to Arkhangelsk five years ago and was shocked by the living conditions of its inhabitants. I was touring the district called Sulfati and kept thinking that I got into some disaster area. I've visited many cities in Russia, but I've never seen so many people living in such terrible conditions. The entire district is full of rotten, dilapidated wooden barracks. And this isn't the only district of its kind in Arkhangelsk. The Soviet government built these barracks in the 1930s and 60s as temporary housing. Since then, the USSR has collapsed, as of the barracks. These houses are stuck in a kind of limbo. They can no longer survive, but they can't die either. Five years after my last visit, the situation in Sulfat district has not changed. The same people are living in the same houses, and the authorities aren't rushing to relocate them. However, over these five years, Arkhangelsk has had three different mayors. The new mayor, Dmitry Morev, agreed to tour the city and look at the life of Arkhangelsk with me. Although, at that moment, he'd served as mayor for only a couple of days, so I couldn't really blame him for anything. What about the Sulfat and resettlement? The people have been waiting for 20 years to get resettled. Look, here's the situation. We have almost three and a half thousand multi-apartment wooden houses in our city. Of these, 900 have already been recognized as dilapidated. Every year we label 100 to 120 more houses as dilapidated. And the resettlement program we are currently working with obviously doesn't meet these needs. But we're working on it. We're working on it. How many people get resettled under this program every year? Well, we now have a five-year resettlement program that's supposed to provide resettlement for 350 apartment buildings. And we now have 900 of them, as I said. So if you say there are 300 houses to get resettled over five years, and then every year there are 100 more houses, then the number of dilapidated houses is increasing rather than decreasing. Yeah, I have to admit that. Yeah, this barrack is burned down. And this one is pretty stable. Although people say these houses are fine. One lady just told me there's no need to resettle them. They're fine. I guess fine is when they're not rickety or sunken. Here's the yard that obviously is no asphalt, nothing. The ground is more or less solid now that it's frozen. When it's spring and it gets a little warmer, it becomes impossible to walk on the roads here. That's what it looks like and you can find more photos on the internet. It's a total mess. That's a typical situation. 
there was a pipe burst. You can get an idea of what conditions these houses are in, the houses that people live in. If you look at all this, it seems like this is a natural disaster scene, that this is some kind of abandoned village, that people can't live here. But you see curtains, some plants, and it becomes clear that, unfortunately, people continue to live here. Despite that pipes are broken and it stinks of sewage, everything is leaking. In summer and after the rain, everything here gets flooded. And that's why there's a kind of raised sidewalk near many of these barracks. Rats are running around and it's just absolutely terrible here. Basically, I don't know how people live here, but the story's been going on just like this for years. There's no end in sight. Hey, while you're here, do me a favor, share this video on Reddit so that more people can see it. Now this is quite an unusual case because these barracks aren't just some ordinary two-story pieces of wood, but they're also nicely decorated. This is some kind of wooden uh, decor here, and this one is the most unusual because it even has some plat band around the windows. There's also some wooden decor in the middle, which used to be painted with bright paint. Everything is inhabited, there are cars everywhere, and people live here. Here's a very typical case. There are water pipes and they're completely rusty and rotten. Here here it's leaking, there it's leaking, and it's not something that's out of the ordinary. No one's doing anything to repair it or to seal off these pipes. It can leak for months here. The water flows under the houses, they rot, and nothing's being done about it because everything is a mess here. It's all in disrepair and it can't be fixed. Surprisingly, nobody's paying attention to all this chaos while we're filming. The people walk by and wonder what it is we're so terrified of. They say, have you never seen anything like this? Well, I haven't. Let me show you my house. This is where I lived until the 15th of August. I'm so lucky to have been resettled. The door barely opened, and I was afraid that the stove would just one day collapse on me. This was my room before it used to be a kindergarten. At first, there was one group of children, and then two. Jesus Christ, what a mess. I used to come here from time to time to pick up my stuff. The last time was a month and a half ago. Just look at this. Horrible. It's crazy that even all the wiring is torn out. Look at this sideboard. When I came here after two weeks, it was already empty. Please, come in. No one's home now, so there's water. In the morning, it's impossible to take a shower. The house is rickety, and so are the walls and the doors. The door can only close like this. Look, the flooring is broken. In 2004, our house was raised and the piles were changed. And now the house is skewed. There's no point in repairing it. According to the website for the Housing and Communal Services Reform, 27,350 people were included in the resettlement program of the Arkhangelsk region for 2019 to 2020. Now 10,000 people were from the city of Arkhangelsk itself. However, only 9,500 people were meant to be resettled into new homes. It's not clear what the rest of the people were supposed to do. However, even this number of people weren't eventually resettled. And there are many more in need of new housing in Arkhangelsk. Hey there, how are you? I'm fine. Do you live here? Yeah. Do you know why these barracks aren't getting demolished? Why are you asking? Oh, we're from out of town. I don't know. They're not resettling. They're not so bad after all. Uh, this one and that one and that one over there. Well, those ones are quite new. Quite new. Yeah. And those rickety ones? Oh, these houses are about to be resettled. I was here five years ago and already back then they were about to be resettled. Yeah, we don't know when. There's one nearby that's currently being resettled. And these ones will be too, very soon. So you believe they're going to be resettled? Of course they will be. They've already started, so... All right, so how's everything else here? Everything's fine. No complaints? No, what's there to complain about? All right, so even though it's autumn, there's water all around the house. Everything is damp here. The pipes are leaking and rotting. Also, it stinks like hell in the summer. These barracks are slowly starting to either sink into the ground or starting to collapse. The sewer pipes burst and damage the houses even more. Now, this nightmare's been going on here for ages. As you can see, this is a 
typical situation here. It never ends. It's always very damp, and you can imagine the conditions inside the house. We're talking dampness, mold, fungus, rats, and the entire district is like this. Here, someone was lucky and got resettled, because some windows are boarded up and some are just broken. But the rest of the house is uninhabited. Look, the house is in such a bad state that there are some wooden planks covering a hole in the wall. The pipes are broken and the house is rotting while upstairs the lights are on, meaning people still live here. Okay guys, so this is a sewer. It may look like a lovely river or like a canal in Amsterdam or like some trendy landscaping element, but no, it's a sewer that was urgently dug up because it was clearly made in a rush. Also, the smell definitely means it's a sewer. How are you? I'm all right. Are you? No complaints? No. So you like this? What? The house, it's about to collapse. Oh, I don't care about that. Oh, you don't care. Nice. This is another typical case here. When you speak with the locals, they all say, it's fine, we've got no complaints. It seems like they just put up with this. That's why many of the things we see can be explained by the fact that local people simply have put up with the circumstances and they think this is all right. There's nothing to complain about. It's better to just leave it the way it is. Similarly, the government is in no rush to solve this problem or to do anything about it. As a result, everyone's supposedly satisfied. Everyone's internally outraged, but overall, after all these years living in this mess, the people got used to it. We keep asking people how they feel, and they all say, it's all great, even though we're literally standing in front of a building that's about to collapse. I mean, I'm scared to even come close to it. It's very damaged and rickety. How can this be fine? Just look around. But the people are satisfied. I feel like I'm in some horror movie. I hear children's laughter and it's somewhere in the woods. I guess this was once part of the school's territory, but now it's abandoned. And there's like a proper forest here. <laughs> I guess nature's healing. We were lucky that the trail was frozen, otherwise we would have sunk deep into the mud. There are some doors and canisters laying around. It all looks very creepy. Ooh, watch out, that's slippery. All right, we're now entering another one of these houses. The door won't close because the house is so sunken that the doors become immobile. You gotta bend down to enter. You can also see the water level here. It's all flooded. Obviously, these houses have no straight walls left and many of the windows are cracked. Everything looks damaged and it looks really creepy and scary. I have no idea how people can live here. And all the houses are like that. So it's not like we found one bad house. They all are. This is dilapidated housing completely unsuitable for human life, but it's still inhabited by many people. All of a sudden, a two-story panel house that's located here for some odd reason. This looks like elite housing. When you walk around here for several hours, you don't see any straight lines because everything's crooked, rickety, and broken. And then all of a sudden, a straight two-story panel house. It's such a huge contrast that I'm starting to fall in love with it. Look, there's another house that's collapsed from dilapidation. It's crazy that it's not getting demolished. For example, this one is totally inhabited and it's not collapsed. And that one is collapsed in the most natural way possible. And it was just left standing here in this ruined state. It collapsed and no one's bothered. I wonder at what point they decide to demolish the house. Probably at a point when it literally starts to collapse when the walls and ceilings start to go down. Only then will people be resettled. Before that, you have no choice but to live here. No one's rushing to resettle the people, even though these houses are clearly in untenable conditions. What do you think about all this? Well, the entire township is collapsing. Our little town. You know, five years ago, I was here from Moscow myself, and nothing's changed in those five years. Yeah, that's right. This is one of the main streets in the town and the people didn't even board up the windows. People throw garbage inside and children are playing around. This is a highly dilapidated house that can go at any second. No one gives a damn. Do you like these houses? No. Finally! Why are you the first person to complain? <laughs> I don't know. Are people being resettled? I'm not sure. Definitely not in our house. Oh, I see. There's one house that's supposed to be demolished, but it's not clear when it's going to happen. And how do you live in these houses with all this crazy dampness? Yeah, it's really damp everywhere. The basements are flooded. 
We're getting resettled in 2025. 2025? Yeah, they've just put it on the list last May. How much do you pay for utilities? Okay, so I have a three-room apartment in which four people are registered. We pay about $80 for electricity. 80 a month? Yeah, around 80 bucks a month for four people. Another wooden barrack where people live, and as you see, these people are desperately trying to maintain it, despite that it's completely rickety. As you can see, it's sinking into the ground so much that the door doesn't close. Everything is crooked and slanted, the windows are being squeezed out. Nevertheless, there's still some old window frames remaining, some decorative snowflakes, and people take care of the surrounding area. They mow the lawn, they plant flowers. So even in these inhuman conditions, they're trying to keep the life going. And the people manage to love their home and take care of it as much as they can. But of course, it all looks like a place where people shouldn't live. Also, you guys can't smell this, but it smells like sewage. The water is nowhere to escape and it stays here all the time, making the house decay. In winter, it freezes and then it melts again. This means mosquitoes, rats, cockroaches and other insects. And of course, the terrible smell of sewage that you can't hide from. I mean, it's not easy walking around here when you're not used to these smells. So uh, where's the toilet? We have a free fall toilet inside the house. Oh, so just like that? Yeah, just like that. There's no sewage? No, no water pipes, nothing? Nothing. What about heating? We have stoves. Oh, so you fire up the stove? Yeah, that's all we have. But hey, at least we have a roof over our head. I see. Okay, thanks. Excuse me, do you know why the water's green? It's the chemicals. Chemicals? To clear the pipes? Oh, I see. It's, uh, it's totally harmless, by the way. Ah, okay. Looks weird. All right, so there's pipe cleaning happening right now. They put some green liquid chemical inside these pipes and the water turned bright green. I'm also struck by the constant leakage from these pipes overhead. The water falls down and forms these weird green puddles on this frosted carpet. All this in front of ruined and rotten houses. I can't think of a better location to shoot a horror movie. Welcome to Arkhangelsk, Sulfat district. The real hell on earth. Let me think, I was two years old? 48 years ago was the last time this house was renovated. It was a major renovation. We used to have stoves before. That was 48 years ago. You can't touch the walls because it'll give you an electric shock. There's water everywhere coming right from the ceiling. This is what our bathroom looks like. There's constant leaking. We can't repair anything either. A pipe has recently burst. They dug up this hole a month ago. I've sent numerous requests, but nothing's been done. And I had to pay from my own pocket for the commission to recognize the house is unsafe. And I had to pay for those experts on my own because you have to wait three or five years for the free enterprise. We're now on the outskirts of the city center. I got a message from a follower on Instagram. He lives here, and he wants to show me these conditions that people live in, even in the center of Arkhangelsk. I'm gonna meet him now, and we'll see what these houses look like from the inside. I guess this is him. Hey! Hi. So these are communal apartments? Yeah, and the doors don't close. No, not here, and not there. That's the exit. All right, these are the rooms. Yeah, it's a section of eight rooms. This is my room, 86 square feet. So how did you end up living here? So I made a mistake. <laughs> I sold my old place, wasted the money on alcohol and bought this room with the money that was left. Then I quit drinking and now I'm working on improving my life. How much did you buy this room for? I bought this room for 7,000. 7,000? Wait, I'm just trying to understand what you paid 7,000 for. It's city center. How much is it per square foot? 81 bucks? Yeah. This is a shared kitchen for eight apartments or eight rooms. 
All right, guys, I just checked the website for real estate listings, and a 646-square-foot, two-room flat in the nearby barrack cost $32,300. Damn. Another one is 861 square feet, and it also cost $32,300. But it looks depressing. I think someone died there. They might be selling it together with the corpse. Look, this isn't that bad, actually. I saw worse conditions in Solfat. Rats run on the ceiling here, and sometimes poop falls down from the second floor, and I have to clean it up. This is how we live. We do all the repairs ourselves. Uh, recently, the flooring collapsed, and we had to fix it. How much do you pay for utilities? $32. Sometimes they randomly turn off the heating in winter. Last winter, they turned it off for a month. And what did you do? I had to buy a heater. Look. Oh, I see. Now some people will ask, why should the government even help these people? It's their own houses that are in this nasty condition. They can go earn some money and buy new accommodations. Now this would have been the case somewhere in America, but in Russia, the situation is a bit more complicated. Now during Soviet times, people were usually underpaid. They were paid mere pennies, which was only enough for food and clothes. They couldn't save up. However, the government promised free housing in exchange for their labor. As such, the flats in these barracks were a kind of salary for these people. Although this type of currency quickly depreciated. As a result, people found themselves without money and without housing, which they received instead of a salary. Therefore, in my opinion, the resettlement of these houses now is the responsibility of the state. This is a social responsibility towards the people who have dedicated their lives to work. They worked their entire lives and got this accommodation as a remuneration for their labor. But the accommodation turned out to be pretty bad. These houses are now collapsing, and the people who have no savings can't solve their problems on their own. The people have been deceived, and it's totally normal for the state to take a bit of social responsibility and help them, and not kick them out on the street or wait until the roofs fall on their heads. All right, here you can see the results of uh, this architectural reconstruction in Arkhangelsk. This historical building has been eaten up, devoured by this massive shopping mall. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say this outright, it was a bad decision to build such a huge mall right in the city center. Secondly, this just looks humiliating. It's clear that they've only left the facade of the building and demolished the rest of it. And this giant construction that destroyed this historical building is absolutely barbaric. You can draw an analogy with like a hunter that kills an animal and hangs its skin or head on a wall. It's pretty much what they've done to this building. They've killed the building and hung its head on the facade of this horrible, disgusting shopping mall. This is actually an object of cultural significance in the region. A house built in 1912. It used to be a manor house and currently is an architectural monument in Arkhangelsk. I'm not sure if it's a residential building, but all the windows are broken. What amazes me is the contrast in the architecture in this place. I say that because the nearby street is full of faceless brick houses, and it all looks like a typical private residential sector. But then we pass just 50 meters, and there's a street with these historical hundred-year-old buildings. Judging by the entrance to this wonderful house, uh, nobody lives here, or someone just doesn't want us to know they live here. They look abandoned and rotten, but they're actually all architectural monuments. This is a real cultural heritage site. Here's one culture heritage object. Here's another. We're surrounded by cultural heritage that has unfortunately collapsed. We're now on the street of Soviet cosmonauts. For a long time, it was famous for being the only street in the center of Arkhangelsk without a proper paved road. There was mud all over the place, and it was kind of a landmark of Arkhangelsk city center. A few years back, it was finally renovated, and now there's a paved road. Uh, however, the rotten rickety houses were left untouched, and judging by the fact that they regularly catch fire, it's unlikely that they'll ever be repaired. That's sad, because our Kongilsk is losing its history, its uniqueness, and its identity. You know, soon these houses are going to be replaced by modern residential complexes, and it'll just be another faceless street. The Russian North, together with the Arkhangelsk region, is a real reserve of wooden architecture. According to the municipality, there are 73 architectural monuments in Arkhangelsk proper, more than 20 of which are built of wood. The abundance of forests and timber in the region has led to much of the construction in the north being made of wood, including the building of barracks. 
Some of these houses are over 100 years old and they look terrible. But there are architectural heritage and they could look decent if they were taken care of, regularly repaired and maintained. Since recently, the problem has been aggravated by the fact that houses began to collapse from the piles. Over the last two years, 10 houses have collapsed from the piles. Eight of them weren't even in the program of resettlement. It's impossible to live in these houses anymore, and people need urgent resettlement. Behind me is the Mikhailo Arkhangelsky Cathedral, a beautiful new cathedral, but for some reason it's surrounded by a fence. The problem of fences in Russian cities is really serious. For some reason, Russian people like to surround all the buildings with fences. What we get as a result is a beautiful piece of land in the waterfront area, which for some reason is inaccessible to people. So this territory is now totally lifeless. There are no people walking around. Why build a cathedral and have nice landscaping when you're just going to seal it off? Give it to the people. Integrate it into the public space so that everyone can use it. But what we have is that all public buildings are fenced off. So much precious land is being wasted. There's nothing more valuable in a city than its land and its public spaces. So why not open it to the people? Instead, it's all being surrounded by fences to create a strict division between sidewalks, land, private property, etc. They didn't even put up the fence properly. It looks so clumsy. They just fenced off random pieces of land. They left some of the lawn. But over there, they decided to cover some of the lawn. Ridiculous. More fences. Fences everywhere. Here and there, every building, every piece of land is surrounded by a fence. Oh, look at this cute little bridge. Let's see, what is this building? Oh, it's a public school. They made this bridge so that students can come to school dry. And here they put little wooden planks so that people don't walk on mud. I see, that's what I call caring for people. Although, this problem could have easily been solved if they didn't put a fence around the school. What's the purpose of fencing off this territory? Why shouldn't people pass here? I'm so fed up with these fences, man. Why do they hate people so much? Hey, what do you think about this parking lot? Oh, like, this is a parking lot. Hey, look, buddy, you should tour with a local. No, I'm serious. They'll show you places that'll give you nightmares. All right, here's an interesting thing about our Kongelks. Whereas in other cities, people discuss weather or their families, here they discuss which areas of the cities are worst. But let's focus on the beauty that's right in front of me. So I'm sitting on a bench and enjoying this mess that's made by people that park their cars here. But this is actually quite a complex problem. On one hand, people blame the government for their inaction. On the other hand, we see that people themselves contribute to this mess. People park their cars on the lawn and they take this dirt right to the roads. Then they inhale it, and their children play in it. And then later, these same people complain that the city's polluted, that their shoes are always dirty. I just can't understand how you can be such an idiot to park your car here. What's on the mind of a person who parks here? Why do this? I don't know. All right, here we are in a courtyard. Now you're right, before we were on the streets, and someone could say, oh, this is a street, it's public space, so nobody's gonna care about it. Well, here we are in a courtyard, and there are no strangers here. The people who destroy the lawns and make all this mess, these bastards, they live right here. Then they and their children walk through this mud. They did it in their own courtyard. Do you know why your neighbors park like this? I don't know, I don't have a car. But what do you think about this? About what? About people parking like this? Oh, I don't care about that at all. Oh, got it. I don't have time for this. Good. Perfect. This is not the first time when I've approached someone, show them something, they say, I don't care. Or they say, I don't even live here. It's not mine. It's none of my business. It doesn't bother me. Unfortunately, most of the people here are like this. Since there are no clean roads in our Kongelsk, people have to improvise. For example, here someone laid carpets and made a real carpet road leading to the bus station. It's all carpeted, guys. I'm like a prince walking on carpets. Oh, they're so pretty and even have drawings. They're everywhere. Look, they go all the way to the right and to the left. People made paths out of carpets. It's very beautiful. Look, okay, they've parked right on the lawn. Is that not allowed? Do you think it's normal that it's so muddy and the dirt spreads along the road and then we get to breathe it in? Yes, all the lawns are destroyed. When I was younger, I used to make flower beds and looked after the lawns. 
They destroyed everything with their cars, saying, Why are you doing this? All we want is to get in the car as soon as we come out of the house. And I say, but then we'll have no flowers, no lawn. And again, we're not somewhere in the periphery, but this time right in front of the city hall. And what do we see? A total mess. The lawns are ruined. Cars are parked all over these lawns. We're talking dirt. We're talking mud. We're talking broken roads. But the advertisement's still in place. We got Billboard 1, Billboard 2, Billboard 3, ads, ads, ads everywhere. And mud. We're in Arkhangelsk. Oh, God, I don't want to leave. Good thing it's not so easy, because there's no bus route map at the bus station, probably to prevent people from leaving. It's also very slippery. All right, so you asked me about quick ways to make the city better. I suggest starting with the bench advertising. <laughs> it's a total disgrace. Now, I, I don't know which one of your predecessors approved it and allowed this to happen, but, uh, but I mean, the problem with advertising in general is pretty serious here. I can't even think of another city in Russia that's so polluted with advertising. Just look at how many ads you have. They're everywhere you look. Look, the entire facade over there, covered with ads. Yeah, yeah, this year we've already made a big step in that direction. You know, together with a design firm, we made a design code for building facades and advertisement posters. Last summer, we adopted this code and hopefully soon we'll have better looking streets. Well, yeah, design code for facades, great initiative. But what about massive billboards in the city center? Look, there's a huge screen, one massive billboard, many smaller ones. Oh, and the bus stops. Can you tell me which buses stop here and where they go? As a mayor, do you know? That's difficult. <laughs> All right, bench advertising's on another level. This is such a disgrace that if you see something like this in your city, just know that your mayor hates people, wants everybody, everybody to feel miserable. Sitting on a bench like this is so humiliating. What the hell even is this? Oh, by the way, this is a metal bench. And it's made of metal so that you'll never want to sit on it. The reason behind that's quite simple. Those who place advertising on benches aren't interested in people actually sitting on the benches and blocking the ad. That's why these benches are often very uncomfortable or, in this case, made of metal. Now, how should people sit on a metal bench? I have no idea. And just when you think there's no more space for advertising left, you stumble upon this fence with ads placed all over it. Not only did they put fences all around the city, but they also put these ugly ads on those fences. Oh, this is only possible in Arkhangelsk, the capital of advertising. All right, man, I, I gotta be honest. It's, this is nuts. Even the fences are covered with ads. I, I've never seen anything like this. But don't you think it's acceptable to have some advertising at least? It's acceptable, sure. But then I think it's a question of priorities. Say you go to a theater and the movie gets interrupted by commercials every two minutes. Now, are you going to visit that theater again? No, you won't. It's fine for the commercials to be at the beginning or at the end. But even then, it still matters what the ads are about and how long they are. And to take it back to priorities, is it more important for you to have a nice city or to pump every single penny out of this city? Okay, first, we get rid of the bench advertising. Then, we repair the wooden footpaths. It's a very iconic thing here, these wooden footpaths. It's a cool local feature that should be preserved. This footpath is new, and I think it's the only positive thing about this area. Now, why wooden footpaths? Because there's certain properties with the soil, and if you make a standard asphalt pavement, it's going to break next spring. Whereas the wooden footpath is the local solution to this problem. There are many in the city center and areas like this. This is the only way to move around here without getting your shoes dirty, especially since you can imagine what this is all like in springtime. What happened to this footpath? It's broken. Who broke it? 
When I ask people what happened to the footpath, they look at me like I'm an idiot. Well, can't you see? It's broken. What's your problem? Now, in general, wooden footpaths are very cool and lovely. Although in winter, they should be sprinkled with granite chips, because at the moment, they're very slippery, and it's really dangerous to walk on them. Besides, they need regular maintenance, because these rotten planks with holes in them are a disaster. Now, on the other hand, there are so many other problems in Arkhangelsk that people here probably don't even pay attention to these footpaths and think that I'm picking on too much. Okay, another question. At the moment, our city doesn't have a dendroplane, and we can't find a specialist in Arkhangelsk to make one for us. We contacted several institutions and landscape designers, but no one's qualified to do it. Our city needs a lot more trees. Moreover, our developers owe us several thousand trees as compensatory planting, but we can't tell them where or what to plant. Now, do you know any organizations that provide these services? Well, I, I can't think of one right now, but I, I know who to ask and who might help. That would be greatly appreciated. Perhaps we could start with the counties first rather than the entire city at once? <laughs> Sounds like you need to create this position for a head gardener. Yeah, I agree. You know, there are head architects, head engineers, but no head gardeners, although landscaping is a crucial process. Here they're changing the asphalt, and there's a huge bus stop ahead of us with lots of buses next to it. All right, let's see if we can figure out how to get out of here. We're now somewhere around the city center, and we need to drive like one and a half kilometers through the main street to get to an even more central location. And we would like to do so in a warm vehicle because we just have the one pair of ears and we don't want to freeze them off. The problem is that the public transport route and schedule is totally incomprehensible. I'm in the city center and I have no clue which bus to take. I'm confused. I'm in Arkhangelsk. These buses are going somewhere, but I don't know where. There's no information at the bus stop, not a single map. I think we need to go to the bus station that's over there. We'll try to catch something. I'm not even complaining about the lack of proper crosswalks. It's a total disaster. Here's another bus stop. Maybe it knows the way. Unbelievable, I see a city map. Oh, it's not a public transport map. It's just a tourist map of the city. Yep. Still can't find the public transport map. Oh, the architecture here is extreme. You know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of pointless and ugly garbage was built here, which completely destroyed the architectural appearance of the city center. Some of you probably think that I show the outskirts and the worst locations in the city. Here we are in the heart of the city center, near the city administration building. And here, all the features of Arkhangelsk are in place. Uh, first, the famous road potholes. Ah, the famous Arkhangelsk potholes that are filled with water. Uh, what else? The wonderful advertisements that are all over the place. And on the other side of the fences, here's the poor landscaping, icy sidewalks, and of course, the bus stops with zero information about the routes and schedules. Nobody will ever need to leave Arkhangelsk. That's probably the mayor. This is the scene that the mayor sees from his office. A great, important, although faded, banner. It reads, Arkhangelsk, the city of military glory. We remember, we are proud, we believe. It's not super clear what the residents of Arkhangelsk believe in, but it is remarkable how even next to this important message, there's room enough for a massive ad screen, because memory and pride don't take away the need to earn money. I happen to think it's very symbolic. All right, so we're out looking for decent landscaping. We were hoping to find it here on the central waterfront, but uh, we haven't found any yet. We've only found asphalt, we found tiles, weird lamps, and chairs. But at least there's no ads on the chairs. See, that's already an achievement by local standards. Now, unfortunately, this cold wind is preventing me from fully appreciating the beauty of this space. 
Very weird landscaping. I don't understand how it works. It's a pedestrian zone, but it's paved with asphalt for some reason. It looks weird. These lamps are also weird. You see here, they're facing the water, and it looks like it's bowing its head at the water. But here, they're facing the opposite direction. Why did they decide to put the lamps in different directions? Weird trash bins too. Here it's got one design, and here it's got another. We're back in the city center, and there's construction work going on. Heavy machinery is driving down the hill with loose soil. And obviously, the trucks have scattered that soil all over the road. They don't clean the wheels. See, that truck just parked right on the lawn and beat the hell out of it. Oh, it's just one big mess. I have a question. What kind of dumb idiots working there? Why do they hate this city so much? Because they're making a mess out of it. And then we wonder why our shoes are dirty and why we have breathing problems. This is why. Look. And nobody gives a damn. This little excavator is making a mess. Everything is covered in mud and no one gives a damn. What do you think about this? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, and then it spreads all over the city. They got a sad little minibus waiting on the side of the road in front of a rotten and burned out wooden barrack. <laughs> this is our Kongelsk. Uh, it's the symbol. It's the symbol of this city. The coat of arms of our Kongelsk should have this minibus and a barrack on it. Oh, also, public transport here is really bad because it's Arkhangelsk. There used to be a tram that existed here for almost 100 years, from the beginning of the 20th century until 2004, after which it was destroyed. There were also trolley buses up until about 2008. Then the trolley buses were eradicated too. They destroyed the eco-friendly public transport system instead of modernizing it and replaced it with minibuses. Whereas most of these houses are typical and faceless barracks, some have an architectural idea behind them. For example, some have nice balconies and plat bands. Some houses even have columns and porticos. For example, this house could have been a nice monument, but it's broken down, it's rickety because it's not used properly. They don't take care of this stuff and they don't do renovations. So often they end up in this critical condition. This is a weird one. We're walking along a nice boulevard, but all of a sudden it stops. You know, speaking of priorities, because instead of a proper crosswalk, which would have let us walk on this beautiful boulevard uninterrupted, we're forced to cross the road, what is it, one, two, three times instead of just one in order to continue walking. That's because priorities in our Kongelsk are upside down. Cars dominate in this city. Yet another example of a mess created by people parking on open soil and then spreading it onto the roads. It's not like we found one exceptional courtyard. No, it's like this in every single one we visit. Right now, it's freezing cold and the ground is somewhat solid. But in spring and autumn, all this soil goes onto the roads. All right, guys, pay close attention. This is a container yard for waste bins. And this is a bus stop. As they say, spot the difference. All right, at least there's a roof and you could assume they thought about the people. But there's also an advertisement, which is not found in the container yards. And I think the roof here is just to protect the ads from the rain. Our Congo Kongelsk is insidious not only to adults, but also to children. For example, this playground located in a sea of mud. It's probably to prevent children from running away. You're not going to get far in all this mud. Still, it's better to play in mud than on a playground called Little Silovic, complete with slides in the form of military equipment and patriotic songs, which apparently should teach kids to love their country. But there is one good playground in our Kongelsk, and I was surprised at where it was hiding. Where do you guys think I am? Am. Judging by these cool swings, are we in some kind of modern hipster place? Actually, we're near the train station. This is our Kongelks train station. The actual station itself is an old rundown Soviet panel building, but next to it is some cool modern landscaping, and the most surprising part is the playground itself. You know, to be honest, I can't even think of another example of a Russian city that has a playground next to the train station. The areas near our stations at home are usually some some kind of exclusion zone, complete with uh, homeless people, you got taxi drivers, uh, small-time scammers, a lot of garbage, stray dogs, stuff like that. Basically, it's a place you want to get away from, and that's in contrast to what we got in this city, a real oasis of beauty. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, here we got a family with some teenagers who were walking by, and they decided to check out this playground, started swinging, taking photos.
photos. Look, if adults like a playground, then it's a good playground. I've often been to Scandinavian countries where wooden architecture is preserved and regularly renovated. There's an understanding that these houses and their inhabitants need to be respected. Okongoksk has the potential to be beautiful, but it needs a lot of work. And unfortunately, many of the European prisons have better conditions than houses in Arkhangelsk where people are living in 2020. Hey, thanks for watching. Please like this video and let me know in the comments if you want to see my trips to Scandinavia. Also, share this video on Reddit so that as many people as possible can see it.